A week ago, BG Robin Gibb finally lost his struggle with cancer and died at the age of 62. For the next hour, we're telling Robin's story in his own words, with occasional interventions from brothers Barry and Morris, drawn from over 40 years of BBC archive, both spoken and sung. I'm Bob Harris, and this is our tribute to Robin Gibb, beginning with the way that the sad news was reported last Sunday night. BBC News at midnight, this is Colin Berry. The Bee Gees singer Robin Gibb has died after a long battle with cancer at the age of 62. He co-founded the band, which went on to produce more than 20 number one records. Nick Hyam looks back on an influential career. With his quavering voice and toothy features, his sensitivity and his vegetarianism, Robin Gibb was an unlikely rock star. The Bee Gees hit the big time in the mid-1960s with flower power anthems like Massachusetts. And when their star seemed in danger of fading, they reinvented themselves as the ultimate disco band. The soundtrack to the film Saturday Night Fever, including tracks like Stayin' Alive and How Deep Is Your Love, sealed their success. Do it once for us. Do you want to stand up? Maybe we should stand up to do some of these songs. It's easier stand when up. you stand up, yeah, to do high notes. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Now you can well, just make ourselves Feel I'm going back to Massachusetts. So. Is telling me I must go home. And the lights all went down in Massachusetts the day I left her standing on her own. Trying to reach her. Let me go right back, though, to okay. Charlton. Right. Is that Charlton. going back far enough to Charlton? Charlton Camardi. Charlton Camardi. And right. I... Is this true? That, in effect, you were told, leave town, young man. Right. Is that true? To leave town? Yeah. No, it would not happen actually quite in so many uh, words. Right, OK. Just to get out. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you were tearaways, weren't you? We were a bit tearaways, but, uh, but in, only in a very light way. Yeah, you know, yeah. It wasn't... A, actually, the real reason we had to get out is because my dad didn't have a job. He just, he just couldn't find a job. He had tried sure. four or five different ones, cheese cutter, plumber, wow. window cleaner, milkman. He had more fun with that one. <laughs> but there was just no... But the money was... They had a big no. family, we needed to get out, and the real reason, we had to emigrate. because, And it was unfortunate, because he didn't want to leave Britain at the time. No. But it was one of those emigration £10 on the ship plans, you yeah. know? Because we were all flat broke. The family was flat broke. And uh, we were all sleeping like four in a bed, including our parents. We're all in the same bed. No, but no, they had their own bed. Yeah. It was just all the kids were on the bed. But it was, it was that bad, and uh, it was just a question of Hobson's choice, really. And when did you... I mean, because I'm always interested, because, I mean, I know I've read stuff about you that you work, you know, you work quite mm. tearaways as little lads, and, and yeah. then... So it's a curious thing to get you then suddenly harmonising. Do you well, know what I mean? Yeah. How, how did that occur to you to do that? It was that? quite a natural thing, really. We were just copying what we were hearing on the radio at the time, and we really didn't know what pop singers were or music uh, to any serious degree, and we just got together and started spontaneously singing this stuff. And then we went on to, like, the matinees at the Gormont, mm. Saturday morning matinees, and the manager would let us go on stage and sing. For some unknown reason, we, we just did it. We weren't self-conscious. But our other friends couldn't really quite relate to what we were doing. And we were very young. We are little kids. And our parents didn't even know what we were doing. This is called Hobson's 
called Let Me Love You. Let me love you, I'll never let you go Let me love you, because I need you so Let me love you, nobody else will do Let me love you, I need you in my arms Let me love you, you and all your charms Let me love you, nobody else will do When, when did you realise then that it was going to be a career? I think after we got to Australia that we realised that it was going to be more than just a, a childish uh, frolic, that we really wanted to do this. And who coined the name? The name we were performing at Redcliffe Speedway, which is in, in Queensland, near Brisbane, and we were doing songs between the races. And as we were doing the songs, people were throwing money onto the track between races, and we used to go and pick up the money. And one day we were singing there, and this disc jockey from 4BH in Brisbane uh, saw us, and um, he was in partnership with a racing driver, promoter called Bill Good. So there was Bill Good, Bill, Good, Bill Gates, and they took us into the auditorium and recorded acetates for us at 4BH, which he put out on his drive time show. People on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're going to play all this on the radio, yeah. aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Insight. The sounds. Insight. The developments. Insight. This week, Alan Freeman introduces the Bee Gees, who discuss their own career and the emergence of Australian pop music. As the British group's boom, led by the Beatles, spread throughout the world, America's domination of Australian pop was overthrown. The Bee Gees became Australia's answer to the Beatles. Here's Robin Gibb. Well, that's a bit of a joke, really, because I mean, we, weren't, we weren't even big in Australia, so... I mean, this is uh, going back to 1964, 1965. We didn't have any, we didn't have any hit records to speak of. We had Warm Wine Women. To, I mean, the Beatles were going number one first weekend and things like that. You know, I mean, it was nice to be tagged. It didn't really particularly make us feel good. We called Australia's Beatles because you know we knew that uh, we weren't on the charts and the Beatles were, and that was all there was to it. So uh, it was just that we were English. We sounded very Beatlish in our music, and that is because. We came from Manchester. Uh, our harmonies were the same as the Beatles and Hollyish, and we uh, we spoke with English accents. You could tell, you see, there, and and that was the reason. It's because we had this sort of northern sound, which was so popular at that time. But uh, the only difference was that all the other northern groups were bringing out records, were being successful, and of course we were in Australia. If we were in England, we probably hadn't had that success. But you see, Australian artists were very sort of played down. Besides the fact that Australian artists were always overshadowed by their British or American counterparts, the Bee Gees also had youth against them. Here's Robin again. Our music was pretty good for, that, for our age, but uh, we were too young to appeal to the kind of people who liked to sort of like buy that music. So we, we, we were between the devil and the deep blue sea. We were too young to appeal to girls to go out and buy the records and, of course, uh, we were also too young for, for, for people to appreciate the music. She is gone. I wanted to ask you, Robin, the Bee Gees' career and your career indeed falls very firmly, if you don't mind me saying so, into three eras, because there you were in the 60s and then right. a huge explosion in the 70s right. and continued good fortune in the 80s, because you're right. currently having a very big hit in America. Who, who were your pals in the music business back in the 60s? Yeah. Were there bands that you were sort of particularly friendly with? Well, um, we came to England rather late in the 60s hmm. and, and, and onto the American scene rather late in the 60s, so we knew, I mean, I knew Graham Nash and people like that uh, just after they'd left the Hollies and getting together with Crosby, Stills and Nash. 
and uh, I've met John Lennon off and on and right. McCartney and Ringo. Did you wish that perhaps the Bee Gees career had started just a bit earlier? Because, as you said, I mean, it really did take off in the late 60s. Would you like um, to have been at the, the height of fame in the middle of the 60s? No, I'll tell you for why. <laughs> I don't think anybody would in, that, in respect to that because I think everyone would have been washed up with the Mersey boom. I was actually in another country when that happened. Right. I was a schoolboy. I was very young. I mean, and when the Beatles came to the fore and the Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Dave Clark Five, I was going to school as a very young boy. And when it all happened, it, I saw it from an American point of view. I didn't see it from an English point of view. And when the boom subsided, so did they. Mm. And that was the tragic thing about that. Well, 1967 started with the three brothers, that's Barry, myself and Morris, my twin brother, arriving back in the UK in February of that year. We'd just come over on a three-week journey on the ship, working our way over in a very exciting Britain. We didn't have anywhere to live. We arrived at Waterloo Station on the... Night of February the 10th, the family, my mum and dad, and, and us three, uh, with absolutely nowhere to go. We had to sort of share a house in Hendon and uh, staying the night there and sort of really slumming it for quite a few weeks until we got a phone call from Stigwood, Robert Stigwood, our, our then to be manager who worked in partnership with Brian Epstein. They'd got our recordings ahead of time uh, that we'd sent over from Australia where we'd been living and we'd just come over from there and uh, I think if Stigwood hadn't contacted us three weeks after we arrived we probably would have starved to death we'd write you know pretend songs we'd hear we'd, we'd hear songs on the radio we'd, we'd say well let's write for that artist let's imagine that this is their hero we were about eight or nine when we first started doing this and it became a hobby and after a while I think when you do it for so long it for us it became such a real world that we didn't want to have another world have you seen my wife It was a very fast year for us. An overview was that we were in the studio. We were right in February in the studio doing To Love Somebody in New York Mining Disaster, our first singles in Massachusetts. In the March of that year, we had our first uh, top 10 record in America by July of that year. Things telling me I must go home. To be a songwriter in 67 was a badge of merit. It, it was really a prestigious thing to be a songwriter, which I still think it is if you're an artist as well. And record companies were very interested in the fact that you were not just a, an artist, but a songwriter. And of course, you know, um, we were writing for other people as well. The songs like Massachusetts, for instance, which we never actually went to Massachusetts when we wrote that song, by the way. We wrote it in New York Harbor on a, on a, on a, a yacht. It was... Just one, you know, one of those things where in those days somebody would say, well, I think it was uh, Ahmed Erdogan, the head of Atlantic, uh, came on the boat and said, you know, if you can write a song about anything, write a song about Massachusetts. So we did, so we wrote Massachusetts. There were certainly a lot of colleagues. We met a lot of artists uh, from Otis Redding. Uh, we met the Who, uh, the Mambas and the Papas. Each night before you go to bed, my baby. You know, obviously all, uh, the Beatles and... Um, all the people that were on the Ed Sullivan show because we did the Ed Sullivan show ourselves that, that year and it was, a, it was the show to do in America at that time. You could do one Ed Sullivan show and go to number one, you know. It was a pretty exciting year. You're listening to Robin Gibb at the BBC. The story continues in just a moment. Well, we just heard about the crash, but we put it down to fireworks at first because there's been so much noise. And yet you're only a few yards from the railway yeah. line. Uh, well, I didn't want back onto the railway line. What did you see, first of all, when you ran out? No, oh, it's just this turmoil. Did the train appear to be very full? Yeah, it seemed quite full, really, for Sunday night. My wife, Molly, and myself were going down to her parents' house in Icklesham, in Sussex. So we caught the, the train, and uh, we were coming into London. It was about nearly 10 o'clock at night, and it was, we were going about 90 miles an hour. Trains did go 90 in those days. And it was just outside Charing Cross, and we were in a built-up area. We could see London outside the window, but it was dark and it was raining. And suddenly there was this huge noise. And I looked at my wife and, uh, and, and said, this train's going to crash. And then the lights went out. And then I felt the whole train surge upwards. And we'd gone over onto our side at that point. We were scraping along the tracks at 90 miles an hour. A part of the railway line came right through the floor of the carriage and went straight past my neck and up, almost in a second. Boom. And like glass falling through onto my face, like Niagara Falls from the window. And still, this horrible, terrific screeching noise. It was just going on and on. We were crashing, and it wouldn't stop. It seemed like an eternity. 
and then it came to a halt and all you could hear was hissing and cries far away and I, and I was conscious but we were on our side and I had to lift myself out of the window onto the side of the carriage and I'd go along opening the doors and helping people out and in the distance I saw silhouettes of the other carriages upside down, sideways, over the embankment, into the street and then there was this, these fireworks going it was like a Spielberg movie you could see the fireworks going off in the rain, you know, because it was bonfire night. And then the blue lights coming for us. And these silhouettes everywhere of carriages in the dark, you know, trains. And I was just sitting on the carriage, you know, with all these bodies around me. It was, it was, it was the most horrible thing. And it was a lot of people killed. And it was very, very traumatic. And it was still one of the worst rail disasters in British history. Now I have found that... I mean, it was an incredible decade, you know, men on the moon and things like that, and you had assassinations going on with huge political figures all through the, through the decade. And, uh, and you had Vietnam to that, you know, and you have one of the most vibrant decades probably in the 20th century. So it was, it was actually a very, very powerful decade, as well as a very powerful year, 1967, to, to be living through and, and to be part of. You can be with the Stones at the Speakeasy and the Beatles or Pete Townsend and the likes of those people. In one club and you go to another club and there is no clock. Uh, it's very crazy and drug orientated. You can have four cars outside your front door. When you're in your teens or late teens, it doesn't matter. I remember at the time you know? I bought a car and my, my driver said, it's our wedding anniversary today, he said. And I said, that's terrific, have the car. You know? He did? Yeah, he didn't well, take it, of course, but I... But I, I, that was the way you were. It. That's yeah. the way you were. It was like you were out of control. It's like the Elvis Presley syndrome, you know? I just showed up one day and no one was there, and Barry showed up one day when no one was there. <laughs> and it was just one of those periods where nobody really had any consideration for the other. And so I just buried myself in writing and recording. It was all right, but, you know, everybody thought, you know, it was just another BG song, Saved by the Bell. It was a record made just before the group split up, actually. A lot of baloney going on in the group, um, like Barry leaving to make the movies and all that. Typical sort of uh, teeny bopper group talk going on, you know. Not unlike what you get with the basic real is now, you know, sort of stupid, sort of hogwash, teeny bopper rubbish. And I said, look, I'm going to make a record, I'm going to split if Barry does that and then do that, you know. So, you know, you know, I just walked into a studio and then I invited Morris over to play the piano on Save by the Bell and, and did the back vocals on my own and a couple I did with Morris. And then uh, I think um, we made that record in that two hours. Of course, then I announced I was leaving 12 o'clock at night. You know, I'd ring up the Daily Mirror and things like that. And I'm you know, leaving the BT. This is a shock of business. <laughs> I thought, I, I must have thought it was a pretty big thing then, you know, to sort of split and leave a group. What sort of future have you lined up for yourself now as a solo singer? Well, uh, to write musicals and plays and uh, conduct orchestras, 100-piece orchestra and 70-piece choir. And I can finish the book now called On the Other Hand. Have you? What's that all about? Classical stories, like Dickens type of stories, and how to uh, perform one of these stories in a film, which I am, actually. Uh, that is called The Family Tree. It's about a person called John Family. And you're doing the music for a television version of Scrooge, I can say that. That's right, yeah, and Henry VIII. And Henry VIII? Yeah. What I missed most of was the camaraderie. I mean, I wasn't really trying to be a solo artist, even with Robin Drain and Saved by the Bell. I was just doing stuff to bide my time. I was just in the studio, maybe doing stuff that probably would have been on Bee Gees albums, but I just didn't want to stop working at that time. I was on my honeymoon with my first wife and we got trapped for about a week in an avalanche. We were cut off from the rest of civilization without food or water, literally, four or five days. We had to share a raw reg between the two of us. Our chalet was completely cut off. That sounds terrifying. Yeah, I put it down to experience, but <laughs> it was actually terrifying. After about three days, we were really getting worried. I think because we didn't show up in Geneva, my personal assistant at the time decided there was something wrong and, and came actually looking for us. And I think they used all kinds of equipment to try and get through the snow to, to try and get us in. It took, it took quite a long time. It's quite a serious thing. What state were you in when they found you? 
I think I was in a pretty bad shape from a nerves point of view. I don't think I was too worried about the food. I saw it as a big adventure, really. But I think now when I look back on it, I think it was probably more serious than I actually took it to be at the time. If you were eating your raw eggs, it must have been pretty serious. It was pretty bad, actually, because we didn't have anything to cook enough. <laughs> Can you remember how that raw egg tasted? Actually, when you're really hungry, the simplest foods taste fabulous. I think the human state is predominantly sad. It's in flux. I mean, happiness is quite a fleeting state. I think contentment is probably a more significant emotion than happiness. And I think songs about singing about the human state, actually, people relate to more. It took the Bee Gees little more than a year to realise that their manager, Robert Stigwood, was right when he told them, by yourselves, you're very good, but when you're together, you're magical. By the end of 1970, they were together again. This, is the, this, was, this was one of the first successes we had after we'd broken up. The Reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's so right. About it, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> this sort of has some significance, this song, uh, because we're, we'd broken up, and it's about 15 months later, and we'd just come back together again. <clears throat> We just come back together. Again, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm filling up. <laughs> and um, play the bloody song. <laughs> okay, it goes something like this. <clears throat> okay, three, four. You can just start singing if you like. Yeah. Three, four. I can think of younger days when living for my life was everything a man could want to do. I could never see tomorrow No one said a word about the sorrow <laughs> How can you mend a broken heart? How can you stop the rain from falling down? How can you stop the sun from shine What makes the world go round How can you mend This broken man How can a loser ever win Please help me mend My broken heart And let me live Again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they did manage a couple of British hits in 1972 with My World and Run To Me and continued to turn out an album each year. But they were far from satisfied. By 1974, their discontent had reached a peak. Now, this was a period where we all thought this must be where the change must be. We knew it was going to come, but we were just frustrated about when. And um, it certainly wasn't March 1974. Um, we went into the studio and it just somehow, it was there, but it wasn't there. And, um, and that can be pretty frustrating if you create, if you're, if you're a creative person. Um, and it doesn't matter how many times you hear that particular track over and over, if you can't hear the magic, it's not there. Um, as I said, we didn't know when it was going to come. So, Mr. Natural came out and uh, I wasn't surprised, but it wasn't a, a major hit because um, even though the reviews in America were very good, I, I knew it wouldn't be a major hit and of course it wasn't. The change came, of course, in January 1975 and uh, it was a great moment for me because we went to the studio and I was very perturbed at this point because I wanted to change so desperately last year, it didn't matter when it was going to come, but we were just sitting around the studio and a week went by, nothing. And of course, you know, then I was very down. This was at 461 Ocean Boulevard in Miami. And it was about, I think, two weeks after we were recording that it all happened. It was amazing. It happened, started off with one song and it went and straight through. It's an old story, but it dies hard. <laughs> uh, we were once coming back from Criteria Studios one night, and we have to cross the same bridge every night during the, this album, main course album. It's gone now, isn't it? The bridge has uh, yeah. probably gone by now, but uh, when you go over this bridge, it makes a clickety clickety type of noise, and it's rhythmic, and um, that's where the idea for the song came from. As we were going over this bridge, it went clickety clickety click. 
<laughs> okay, boys and girls. <laughs> this is yeah, how it goes. <laughs> and this is how it happened. Now, please remember mm. the bridge. Oh, yeah. You got it. Okay. Got it. Yeah, right. It's just your job talking, telling me nice, yeah. Job talking, men are discussing. Robert Stigwood had read in the New York Times the tribal rights of a Saturday night and he wanted to make a film about what New Yorkers were doing to pass their time on a Saturday night. He started making the film with John Travolta, who was in a very big sitcom at the time, Welcome Back, Cotter, in the States. So Robert called us and said, making this film. He said, what have you got written so far? I said, well, well, well we said we had five songs written. We've got um, more than a woman. If I can't have you, How Deep Is Your Love, Staying Alive, Saturday Night Fever, and so on. And... Uh, he said, well, they may, we'll fly over and have a listen to them. So he flew over and have a listen to them. And they said, well, we'll take them back and we'll have John work on the set to them. You know? that, was, that was in the June, I think, the following Christmas, the, 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 the movie was out and, and um, it was changed to Saturday Night Fever because of the uh, Night Fever title of one of the songs. Looking back on that era of, of, of the big film, how do you view the songs now? Do you feel that they sound dated, perhaps in 1983, compared with some of the more sophisticated productions that the discotheque world has thrown up in the last two years? I'm not a nostalgic person. I don't hold on to songs that were very big years ago. Like the Three Buzz were very now and tomorrow. We don't like to hold on yeah. to... So the thing about the Staying Alive uh, and Night Fever and things like that, were, they weren't written especially for the film. They were what we call R&B progressive uh, at that time. You know, everybody sort of attacked the Bee Gees, especially in this country, in 1979 for you know, not meaning anything. But I don't think you can say that about our songs. How Deep Is Your Love was a very meaningful song, and it certainly wasn't a disco record, and um, Too Much Heaven. And Staying Alive was about the life in New York City in the fast pace, as opposed to just getting up and dancing. What was your impression? the first time you saw the film. Well, I, I wasn't completely blown away. I didn't think the no, film was that good. Well, thought, we saw, you don't yeah, like I mean, it, Robin? No, like no it. I don't even like it now. It, was, it like, wasn't the like kind of film that I would go and watch. And even for the Times, yeah. I didn't think it was a great film. I think it was just the ingredients that really came together for the Times. Yeah. And I, it, it was, was a just, great marriage of music Obviously, and it was a success, story. very commercial film. But it was not the kind of film that I would queue up and go and see. But then again, no. you know, I'm not the masses. And so. You're listening to Robin Gibb at the BBC. The story continues in just a moment. You, you worked together so closely. I mean, there were times when you would go and, and do a solo career, as, as you're doing again now, and then you'd, you'd come together. Was it ever claustrophobic, working together for such a long time? Uh, I have to say that um, I work with many people outside of my brothers, and, and it's not... It's never been as rewarding as it has been with my brothers, I have to admit. There's a chemistry that, that, that the brothers, that, that, that we have together, that was just magical. And the only way to compare it is in history is that these are the Brontes. They couldn't write with anyone else. They wrote better together. They created their own world and they wrote together. It was the same with brothers, I suppose. You, you have the same feelings and the same emotions about things that you second get, you know what each other is going for. And I suppose it helps in that kind of environment. Smile, an everlasting smile A smile can bring you near to me Don't ever let me find you gone Cause that would bring tea to me Right in 
It's been a long time, Robin, since you and the Bee Gees have been in the studio and recorded. Firstly, I ought to ask you what the reason for that was. Has it been a question of sorting out one's personal lives and getting business yes. together? Bit of both. Actually, sorting out one's life, um, I went through a pretty traumatic experience with divorce, as one would always do. Anybody that goes through a divorce has a lot of uprooting to do. And again, we're also on to producing other artists as well, you know, i.e. the Dion Warwick stuff, and also starting work on the sequel to The Fever album, uh, Fever and Film, which is Staying Alive. It's all a question of confidence, I suppose, but two years away from the recording studio and indeed away from the charts is quite a long time. Is there an element of crossing fingers and hoping, or are you that confident in...? in um, I think with us, we've been uh, making records and producing and writing for so many years now that I think there's an element of confidence as well, but also, I think for us, anyway, we needed to... St- to stay away for two years. We didn't want to be just uh, three guys who brought out an album every year, you know, the usual album from the Bee Gees, and, and here it is. I think people get fed up with artists very quickly like that. I think we needed time off, and two years, I don't think it can do you any harm. And I think with the image that we had then, I think it was time to sort of rest. I think we've always tried to change. Uh, we've always wanted to change. We've never been one to go backwards. If you heard the Fever stuff when it came out, you'll know that we'd never done anything like that prior to that. Well, that's right. Uh, the Woman in You, the song that's uh, in the American charts right now, is uh, more aggressive and more sexual than pr- prior BG stuff. Sexual? Yeah. Now, there's a word on a Sunday I afternoon know, on Radio 1. A little <laughs> close to the bone, I know. The you like, would you like to be more explicit, or perhaps that probably wouldn't be a good well, idea? Maybe on the vicar might be listening. <laughs> could well be. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, the big question about the woman in you is, is uh, you know, talking about bringing out the man in me and things like that, you know, it's... Uh, I think we got your gist, yes. I know. I think that was the fight. Oh, you didn't get it from me. Juncture. Quite, absolutely. <laughs> Let's have another record before we all get yes. covered in embarrassment. We were just talking while that was playing, but listening intently to the record and enjoying it, I hastily add, um, about some of your old songs. And and I was just saying to you that if, for instance, I plonked on, I don't know, Saved by the Bell or Mm -hmm. something from your deep distant past, how embarrassed would you be? How red would you go? And you were saying that really it's the production that makes you sort of a a bit quirky. Oh, yes. I I think the songs were geared to the the, the times, of course, but uh, so I'm I'm not going to get red about that because that's what was right then. But the production leaves a bit to be desired because the production techniques have changed and our art of producing has changed. We've developed, we've got better, but those were the best you could do at that time, I think. Well, I was going to say, I mean, when you recorded something like Massachusetts, did you come out of the session that night thinking, this is great, we've got the whole recording world at our at our fingertips? No. <laughs> no? Okay, what a load of crap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was drunk at the time. Come on, it's easy, it's easy to say looking back, but presumably... It's true, I mean, though. Really? I mean, I've never known anybody to rave about anything that, that's been a number one before it was came out, because everyone says it's number one, you think, that's it, that's the magic sound, it's going to be number one all over the world, I'm telling you, it's going to be gold in five weeks. It's not the way it works we got everyone did the saturday night fever stuff you know everybody thinks god when those songs are finished in the studio everybody must have gone in and absolutely fallen over on the floor thinking good god a phenomenon i can hear it it's born it's here don't move you know go and get my bank account ready it's not quite like that at all i'm not sure that i believe you we we suggested the title for the movie we said how about a saturday night fever for the name of the film Mm. and everyone said no no it's too pornographic so that went out the window. And then they said, and then we played Night Fever and the songs, oh, I don't know, I don't know. 
It's yeah. mine. It's got to be an integral part of the overall movie. Or get out. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Start Nor- again. Some of your northern roots coming out here. I <laughs> detect very strongly. Yeah. Let me talk to you about the other side of your involvement and your brother's involvement in um, production, because you've right. worked with quite a number of very legendary names over the last few years. Was that a natural progression, or were you pestered and badgered at social events by people nudging you and saying, you "I think it was fancy a bit producing so and so"? Bit of both, Andy. The fact that we want to expand as well. We were very determined to get out of just being. Being the Bee Gees, we want. We, we're very proud of the Bee Gees, and I think it was important that we had to expand and, and widen our horizons for the sake of the longevity, not just of the Bee Gees, but the Gibb Brothers as an entity, as producers and songwriters. Mm. We needed to to break out, and I think it was very important doing the Barbara Streisand uh, Guilty album, which we wrote all the songs for, and uh, and Barry doing the production, and then followed by the Dion Warwick album Heartbreaker, which we wrote and produced again, and uh, now we're in the studio doing Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton. Come on, we have to do it. Run through it a few times and we just do it. Yeah. Well, he can't reach it out. Yeah, he can't. If he does it enough times, he'll warm up. Islands in the stream. That is what we are. No one in between. How can we be wrong? Set away with me to another world. And we rely on each other's heart. From one love. <laughs> we can very easily adapt to other person's styles but with, again again what we try to do is not uh, ju- just give them songs that they have always been singing we like to give them songs they haven't really sung before i shall step backwards by two paces and ask you if you've heard and if you have what you think of the heebie-jeebies have the heebie-jeebies have you heard these characters yes i have actually and uh, <laughs> i think they're, 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 they're lovely smiling. girls they're smiling. lovely girls <laughs> <laughs> they're three nice girls in fact were you actually offended by all that because no no because i paid them I said, go out there and copy us. <laughs> <laughs> I know them, they're my best friends. <laughs> what a splendid answer on a Sunday afternoon. I think the key thing about anybody in this business is not to take themselves too seriously. That's right. Then it's fun. If kids are enjoying themselves and they're getting off over you, I think you should enjoy it. He's with my life. And first of the 80s with It's Still Rock and Roll to Me. Billy Joel. Is right again. The man's on a roll. Yeah, absolutely. With Billy Joel. In which year did this week's top three have... Justified and Ancient by the KLF and Tammy Wynette at number three. When You Tell Me That You Love Me by Diana Ross at number two. And Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me by George Michael and Elton John at number one. Which year would that be? Um, which year would that be? I would say um, it, some, uh, sometime in the 80s. 90s? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 93? Mm-hmm. No. 97? No, 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 no. 94, no, 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 it's got to be one of them. It's got to be one to ten. James, go and have a go. <laughs> 92. 91. Yeah. Anyway. I was only out by eight years. It was the end of 91, <laughs> so you were close. Uh, here's a bonus question again on classic well, albums, that's not Robin. fair, because I mentioned every single year in my life. <laughs> the trio topped the charts in four consecutive decades and sold more than 110 million records worldwide. But their fans across the world were saddened a week and a half ago to hear that Morris Gibb had died suddenly in hospital in Miami. He was only 53. His twin brother Robin, who was about to launch his latest solo album, told Jenny he was still shocked by the loss. It's still, to me, very, very fresh and still unbelievable that anything like this could have happened so quickly and out of the blue. So... It's it's not like he had a long illness. You, you prepare yourself as somebody with a long illness, and and they have chances, and there's hope. And uh, with Morris, it was just so quick, and it's so quick to the point I still can't believe it now. So one just has to either sit down and think about it all the time, and go crazy, or just throw yourself back into work again. And that's what I, I have to do. It's terrible for both you and for Barry, but but you were his twin. Yeah. How? How close a twin relationship was that? Well, it's it's hard to say in, in so much as, of course, we were close. There's no doubt about that. But the three of us have always been very close because of our music and our writing. And we have been that way since we were, we were children, that we, we always wrote together. So, in essence, we were almost like triplets rather than, than twins and one big brother. So, it, it, it's not just so much uh, as losing a twin, but it's just as losing a very close brother as well. Yeah, and, uh, OK, we'll... Uh... The one, the one you mentioned runs me. We'll give that a shot. I think it, uh, it's a bit difficult, but we'll try it. <laughs> we will write these. <laughs> yeah. What's the first line? The first you line. Never, is... You go raining. Yeah, right, right, right. You never, 
you got rain in your heart Someone has hurt you and torn you apart Am I unwise to open up your eyes to love you And when you got nothing to lose Nothing to pay for and nothing to choose Am I unwise How about, uh, what, what other sort of influences um, uh, musically uh, have you had that are sort of outside of the pop pop? Um, well, we were always influenced by soul music and uh, the, the black music uh, music scene in America in particular, Otis Redding, Sam and Dave and the Stax mm. uh, stuff of, of, the, um, of the late 60s. Incidentally, To Love Somebody, uh, which is our second single, which actually, was actually written for Otis Redding uh, on the weekend before he was killed. Uh, oh. And it was written in the St. Regis Hotel in New York, and he was going to record it. Uh, and he was on his way back to New York, of course, when, when he was killed. So we did it ourselves, and that's the story of To Love Somebody, incidentally. Uh, well, so it was planned for him. Yes. Perhaps we could do it now. We give can give it a bash, yes. But let's yeah. give it a go. There's a light, certain kind of light. Shine on me I want my life to be Live with you Live with you There's a way Everybody said To do each and every little thing But what good does it bring Somebody to love somebody the way I love you in my brain. I see your face again. Somebody to love somebody the way I love you. Oh, maybe you don't know what it's like. Maybe you don't know what it's like to love somebody. Somebody to love somebody the way I love you.
<laughs> Robin Gibb with To Love Somebody, which, of course, they wrote for uh, Otis Redding, but, uh, and then was a huge hit for you. That's right, it was our do. first hit single in America. Uh, what a great oh, song. Yeah. And thank you very much for being our guest today. Thanks, Jules. Robin Gibb. <laughs>